Today I'll talk about chapter 7 again, about diversity and inclusion. And in this clip I will dive into the psychological theories that lead to making distinctions between people. So basically, what leads to discrimination and what leads to inclusion. After this clip, you will understand the following. First, I will dive into this very important concept of stereotypes and how that kind of rules all of us. Um, then I'll elaborate on this idea of stereotypes by going into social cognition. So how does your mind actually work and why do stereotypes keep hindering us or helping us? Um, then I will dive into social identity theory, in short, SIT, um, that talks about how stereotypes and also de determine who you are and how that helps us to understand how we, who we are in the world. And then finally, I will dive into inclusion and then in particularly into the theory that says that everybody needs to feel appreciated also by being a little bit unique. So like that, let's first start and have a look at stereotypes. Talking about other people. So in a scientific definition, stereotypes are defined as socially shared sets of beliefs about traits that are characteristics of members of a social category. And we can all think of stereotypes of people from another country, about old people, young people. Just read a few of the examples that are here in, here in pictures and you'll have a, an idea about which stereotypes can be triggered. For example, when somebody tells you that at the age of 16 she had a child. She must be a slut. So these kind of associations are called stereotypes and they are triggered quite fast. So why do stereotypes exist and why do people use stereotypes? In this lecture, I will show you that there are two main reasons why stereotypes exist and are used. The first one has to do with cognition. It is a, a, a way to produce information in an effective way and to make sure that we can act quickly upon the things that we see. So it facilitates effective dealing with information in the world around us. I will talk about social cognition theory there. Also, stereotypes about other people say something about ourselves. So it is a way to define who we are as a person. It is a way to maintain our self-esteem. And these kind of group cognitions are explicated in social identity, identity theory, which I will discuss after discussing the, the mind itself. So what happens in your mind when you see people that are of another group? Social cognition is the, the research domain that dives into how the mind processes information and how people can actually live. Um, your mind is a really complex thing. Actually, m many things that happen in your mind don't happen in a conscious way. I don't need to think about how I talk each time. It's kind of automatic. If I want to respond, I can just speak. I don't need to you know, activate the, the entire language processing before I can do that. Um, and many, many other things are automated. A lot of your, your mind is full with schema to, to understand the world around you. If you get up in the morning, uh, you know the way to the bathroom. You know, these kind of things are all mental shortcuts and they, they happen unconsciously. Um, and they help to, you to just live. They help to efficiently process information. A stupid thing is, is that these mental schema, they all, although they are really efficient, they're not necessarily right. So for example, imagine a situation that you, that you get up in the morning in another house and then for a moment you're entirely confused because you can't remember and step into your normal routine. So at that moment, your mental scheme about your morning routine is disturbed. You have to consciously process information, think, where am I? Where is the bathroom? So these kind of things illustrate that the shortcut about what the world looks like is not necessarily always the right way that we should process the information. A small example also illustrates that uh, when something unexpected happens, we are 
suddenly aware of these unconscious assumptions, these unconscious mental models that we have, and then we need to rethink. And the good thing is that we are able to do so, so we can adjust our mental schemas to, uh, um, to judge the world around us. So I talked about uh, your morning routine. You can do the same about finding your keys. You probably all ran into the situation where you thought your keys were in the place where you put them usually, and then they are not there. And then all of a sudden you need to rethink, where have I been, where, should, where, where did I drop them today? So the examples I gave up to now are all about the material world, world around us or just your own behavior. But we also have the schema when it comes to judging and dealing with other people. And there it becomes tricky. So stereotypes also try, are also used to make sense of the world around us. Um, a key thing here is, is an attribution. We see something, and in order to know how to relate to what we see, we, uh, we use a schema that explains what we see. And this is what we call an, uh, an attribution. So we can use, for example, you are in a, in, a, in a store and you want to just buy something, you're at the counter, and then in the corner of your eye you see a young person with a hoodie pulled over its head and uh, walking a little bit uh, suspicious in your mind, you're already making attributions, this is a weird person, why doesn't he show his face? Or she, because, because it, it, it's hooded a thing. Um, so your mind already starts to make all these assumptions about the behavior of this person and also the intentions of this person. So in your mind, you already think, hmm, this might be a shoplifter. And you don't know anything. This person hasn't done anything, anything yet, yet. But just by your mind makes you aware that there might be a threat, it might be dangerous. So attributes, this is an example of a negative one. It can also um, be positive, so these are favorable or unfavorable dispositions towards social objects, such as people or groups and places and policies. Um, and attributes, like I said, they add meaning to what you see. They help you to understand what is happening and what the causes, is, causes are for what you see. Um, an important thing is also if you can sometimes think that people behave because they are who they are or because of the situation. So they can, you can attribute it to a person or to uh, their situation. Stereotypes are a form of attributes. They are these cognitive structures that provide the knowledge and the beliefs and the expectations about other people, about individuals, based on their social group membership. And they are triggered in a fraction of a second. And I'm going to show you an example that was, uh, happened a few years ago. Uh, so like in many countries, we have uh, uh, in the Netherlands uh, a rap scene, and Typhoon is one of the most famous rappers in the Netherlands. He's very much valued, appreciated, built artist. Uh, however, uh, it happened to him that he was stopped on the highway uh, because he drove a very big car and he's a colored man. So the assumption or the stereotype that was triggered his, uh, his holdup at the road was that this was maybe drugs money involved. Uh, typh typhoon being, you know, popular and well known, as, as the moment that he opened his window and the police recognized him, they apologized, uh, and also later they acknowledged that, in fact, this profiling uh, was, it, was indeed the re reason why why they stopped stopped him. Um, typhoon then felt. Uh, the, the need to, for once, talk about it in the news, and it raised a whole discussion about how uh, certain minority groups in society are negatively stereotyped, and that this again and again leads to situations in which they have to uh, reason that they are not in the wrong here, and you can imagine how that makes the minority people, uh, in this case, uh, feel. So stereotypes are an important way to function effectively. However, the consequences is, is that we treat people that fit the stereotype, or we can treat people that fit the stereotype in a stereotypical way. So 
how does it work? When is the stereotype activated and when, it's, when, can it, when can you keep it quiet? Like I said, stereotypes are activated in split seconds. If, if, you, do, if you think that you don't do this, try for yourself. There's this uh, Harvard project of implicit stereotyping. Um, you can see the link in the slide. And there are all these little tests. You'll be surprised, even if you think that you're, you're woke as hell, that you are very, uh, very much also uh, thinking along stereotypical lines. How does it work in reality, in, in, the, in, in social interactions? Um, so the moment you're confronted with somebody who is different, uh, you first need to realize that that person is different from the rest. So we call this uh, salience. As you can see in the, in the picture of the white sheep, the black sheep stands out because he's completely different from the other sheep. So in that case, imagine that this is a person in a group of homogeneous other persons, the stereotype about this black sheep are activated. Um, so this is obviously more the case for groups or individuals that belong to minority groups than to majority groups. So the, the, the chance to stand out in a homogeneous group is larger if you belong to a minority group than for a majority group. The stereotype holds expectations about who people are and what they do and what they should do. So stereotyped beliefs about how people who belong to a minority group, they are activated and they also influence how we react to those people. Imagine that you are uh, invited to the birthday par party of your grandmother and uh, you arrive a bit early before the rest of your family members and the room is still filled with uh, all her friends and they are all like over 80, so really, really old. Um, and you're apparently or you're obviously the youngest person in the room. That will trigger stereotypes about younger people. So the conversation that you will have with these elderly women will be about your being a represent, uh, representing of uh, young folks. Uh, you work with mobile phones and you are these digital, uh, dig digital people. So this is a, a kind example of a stereotype, but you can imagine that there are many situations in which the stereotypes hold negative uh, associations and that they hinder people in uh, functioning well at work. Um, so this is what we call the stereotype threat. The stereotype is activating a process that happens after a difference is uh, becomes salient, and then this, this behavior starts. Stereotype threat means that those who observe the difference will respond to that person as being a member of that particular group, of this particular minority, and disregard all the uniqueness of that person. A risky thing is, is that the salience also influences how this minority person in a group starts to behave. There is a risk that this individual starts to act in accordance to the stereotype. So back to the, to the birthday party, where you are the youngest one, there's an age difference of at least 50 years, and you will, you know, you will feel young, you will feel apart. There's a lot of research that uh, shows that when people start acting according to their stereotype, they're actually, uh, especially in organizations when it comes to, uh, to moving to higher ranks, uh, that they uh, disqualify themselves by behaving in a minority stereotypical way. This is one of the explanations why women, for example, are uh, less inclined to be willing to work in the higher ranks of the organizations. And then the uh, debate was, this is a sticking floor, women don't want to grow. Interesting discussions. So stereotype threat influences the behavior and the decisions in organizations. So let's turn to an example how that might work. There's a famous experiment 
about uh, the fake CV experiment that is called. So research shows that there are uh, gender and racial biases for both men and women uh, in the preference for job applicants just based on the name of the applicant. So the fake CV experiment uses exactly the same CV. So these people have the same job experience, they apply for the same job, they have no, no difference whatso whatsoever. And the only thing they do in the, uh, in the job ad, in the CV is change the name. So in this case, you see uh, John and Barbara, but you could also use a foreign name. Um, you could also maybe change the, uh, the age in the, in the CV. So there are many different ways in, in which you can, uh, can design an experiment. And in all these experiments, everybody, no matter who you are, men and women, ethnic, non-ethnic, they all have a preference for the white male. This is interesting, isn't it? So it's a strong evidence how stereotypes, even if we think that we don't use them, and we do use them. So what can we do about it? What can we do to overcome stereotypes? How can organizations help their employees to overcome stereotypes. Because, mind it, if you want to be a diverse organization or if you just want to make sure that diverse groups work well together, then you have to work on, um, on mending the stereotypes about each other. So, what we know, so as long as stereotypes are implicit, if we don't discuss them, they will influence our behavior and the behavior of others. Remember when we talked about uh, the daily routine and the keys? We need to activate the cognitive scheme that belongs to a stereotype, like we need to activate the place where we locate our keys. We need to disrupt the existing schema that, um, to make sure that there is attentive information processing and that the uh, um, stereotype is at the discussion and that they will actually look at the person. So what does this person bring in relation to the task that we are doing? So how do we do this uh, in organizations? So we can uh, work on updating the stereotypes, for example, by intervention methods such as uh, uh, offering training. Uh, what really helps is to diversify the communication in the organization. So if, if there's a picture of the, of the board of your organization doing important things, make sure that this board is visibly diverse because that demonstrates that uh, everybody can be a top manager. Uh, increase the visibility of minority members in the organization. So these are examples that help to overcome stereotypes and to build a more inclusive uh, organizational environment. So that was it about cognitive processing. I'm going to move on to group processes, where still the stereotypes play a very important role. So, in the coming slides I will talk about social identity theory. And social identity theory is important because it helps us to define who we are. The processes in how we talk about others, how we relate to others, these also help us understand for ourselves who we are. However, there's a downside to these group processes that is that they can also lead to excluding others. So in this process of defining ourselves, we may unconsciously exclude other people and discriminate. So what is, uh, what is social identity theory? theory? I'll read and explain. So people define themselves, and how you define themselves, that's called your, your social identity or your identity, by relating to groups to which you belong. So, I, de I define myself as a woman, I define myself as a scholar, an academic, I define myself as a mother. So this is kind of the part of the groups to which uh, they are me, this is what, who I am. It also directly indicates that the definition of who I am, I need groups, other groups. I need groups to define who I am. So my social uh, identity is grounded in being a member of social groups. And we need to also compare to feel good about ourselves. So I'm a proud mom, I'm a proud scholar, I'm a proud woman. So, and this uh, we know from, uh, from minimal group uh, 
paradigm theory that uh, the moment you tell people that they are part of a group, um, so you can divide a classroom in uh, small groups, uh, of, uh, and you have these groups uh, decide names, the moment that these people are together, they feel better than the other groups. So this feeling good is a, an outcome of being a member of a group. And you define this feeling good by saying that the others are worse. Of course, you can feel, there's a gut feeling, that the moment you start to define yourself as a group member and also say that your group is the best, then discrimination is bound to happen. So what, just to summarize, how, what are the key elements of this social uh, identity theory? It starts with me, self. You want, I want to be, feel good about ourselves. Everybody wants to feel good about themselves. And we also uh, look for clues that make us feel good about ourselves. If we were continuously looking for that, well, to stay, in the, to, to stay with the example that, that women are, uh, are less, less good and that mothers are terrible and that uh, academics say that they are worthless, that is not really good for your self-esteem. So what you do is you try to keep this feeling that, are, that you're proud of your groups and you try to find clues in the, um, from, the, from the environment about you that that is actually the case, that you are a good group. So social identity theory tells you who you are. Um, it helps also to, to, uh, to identify the other groups that you feel member of, and that, de that determines altogether what your social identity is. So where do you stand in society? Yeah. Like said, the moment, you, the moment you define yourself as a member of a certain group, that means that you categorize all the others as well. Are they a member of my group? Are they not? Um, members of my group, they are the good ones. We are the best. And the members who are not in my group, ah, they perform less. They are, uh, and they're, they're just lesser people. Um, actually, if you research this, these distinctions about people who are in the out group, so who are not in your inner circle, they can be quite rude. And they are full of stereotypes. Um, and this keeps happening because we need these stereotypes to make a big gap to avoid that these people might be similar to us and that make, make our feeling good about ourselves a little bit more tricky. So I put it a bit to the extreme, but it has been researched a lot and this is literally what happens. So the moment you put people together in a group, the group, group logic starts to work, you identify with that group and you start to exclude other people. This may be useful in organizations when it comes to competition and the organization as a whole. You want the organization members to be part of this group. However, it becomes problematic if within units or within departments, um, employees feel that they are a member of different non-work related groups. And that is the case when people start complaining about discrimination and when it's actually probably also happening. So from social identity theory, we can draw a couple of lessons when it comes to, uh, to working in organizations, especially to prevent discrimination. In organizations, it is really important to work on defining what is a group, team building exercises, making sure that all the thinking in us is work related, so there, that there are no risks, that there are these fault lines between uh, ethnic or demographic differences. So make sure that everybody, however diverse from a demographic perspective, feel part of the us in the team. And that means focusing on work, so on meaningful work. Make work-related characteristics very salient. Highlight good performance and make sure that this is diverse. Also what really helps is to apply inclusive management and inclusive communication styles, similar to what we discussed in the uh, talk about uh, overcoming stereotypes. A last word I wanted to say about uh, inclusion and inclusion theories. So uh, we discussed a little bit in this chapter 
why discrimination is not allowed, so exclusion, and the different things you can do to make sure that people from minority groups are integrated in the organization so that they have the same procedures and that they have the same um, yeah, possibility to end somewhere. But to really benefit as a whole organization from everybody's talents, you really need to work on making sure that everybody feels appreciated. Not that everybody feels assimilated, because that will still make people feel that they are maybe less or maybe others feel that they are slightly better. You really need to work on the social inclusion of everybody. And this is recent in the so-called optimal distinctiveness theory. In short, the theory says that every individual has two needs. The first need is to belong to a social group, read the organization, and the second need is within this group they want to feel appreciated for who they are. So imagine that you are a close group of friends and you identify as a group and you have been through rough and, uh, and better and worse times and then one of the members um, speaks up and comes out as being gay. A good group of friends, uh, which shows optimal distinctiveness, say, will say, cool, celebrate it and move on. Another group will say, that is uh, uh, more for the uh, integration, um, and you can be who you are, but not in our group. So here in this group, we are just friends, and so we don't talk about it. So these are two differences. The outcome may be the same, the person may be included, but you can imagine that in the first instance, the person will feel much more appreciated and more motivated to contribute to the group. So inclusion is the diversity management practices that help to reduce bias in key personnel decision-making moments. However, diversity management is unlikely to alter day-to-day -day relational sources of discrimination that impacts people's experience of inclusion. So you really, really, really need to manage inclusion. It's not going to happen automatically. Examples of uh, inclusion practices, it starts with pre preventing discrimination, but then on top of that, make sure that you promote the value of diversity and inclusion. Make sure that there is a climate of inclusion, that everybody feels appreciated for who they are. So. Wrap up, now you know that uh, salient diversity characterist characteristics will trigger stereotypes. We can't do anything about that. Um, they, these relate to our social identity, the us and them. Uh, stereotyping uh, may lead to discrimination. And discrimination, we know from research, has huge ne negative outcomes for individuals, but it also has negative outcomes for organizations, both from an ethical, but also from a performance perspective. To change stereotypes, we need to use multiple communication channel channels to make people aware and to prevent discrimination. And we need to also celebrate diversity and manage inclusion. That's it.